Hi, I'm Matt, and in this video, let's find out if the MacBook Air can be used as a professional video editing machine. The M1 MacBook Air, in my opinion, is one of the best computers Apple has ever made. Between the price point this computer starts at, the battery life, performance gains, plus the tried and tested design that's been through years of iteration, if you're an Apple user needing an all-rounder for everyday tasks, and you want the portability of a 13-inch laptop, this is certainly it. But creating videos is a whole other story, and I wish it was as simple as opening your editing app of choice and seeing how many videos you could put on the timeline. But it isn't. Depending on who you are and what kind of videos you create, this is going to be different for everyone. So in this video, I want to cover off how this computer fits into a more professional creator's space. At the moment, I'm using cameras designed for professional video production with beefy codecs. And although this computer wasn't designed or marketed as a tool that can edit these things, I think it certainly can. So let's take a look at some of the considerations, starting with practicality and hardware. But before we get there, make sure to like the video and subscribe if you're enjoying the content. I had a few people in my previous video point out that they were waiting for a MacBook with a bigger display. And honestly, it's not something I actually considered too much because I've never enjoyed owning large laptops. They generally weigh more, need bigger bags to carry them around in, and they're less practical for traveling. However, if this is your primary computer for editing and you do need some portability, a 16 inch display could make a real difference day in and day out. Because 13 inches really does mean that screen real estate for your editing apps are quite limited. Remember, you've got to fit in your timeline, media browser, effects panel, audio mixing, and of course your video preview too. And this just results in a lot of opening and closing of panels, moving things around, and basically more mouse clicks. To get around this problem, it's obviously good to use an external display when you can. Having one monitor for your user interface and another as a reference for your video feed. Having said that, if you don't need the portability of a laptop, it makes sense to go with a Mac Mini. However, it's also important to note a limitation of the M1 chip for the MacBook Air and Pro at the moment is it can only support up to one external display which means if you're looking at the two monitors I have behind me here, it's one or the other. Again, I think for the target audience this computer is designed for, it's not really an issue, but something to keep in mind for sure. The great news is the monitor you can use can be up to 6K, so hopefully that should cut it. And then there's the throttling or potential for throttling on the MacBook Air. Because remember, this computer doesn't have a fan. So when conducting speed tests in DaVinci Resolve, I actually spaced out the renders intentionally to ensure I wasn't doing them back to back. If you were, you'd likely see the speeds get worse as the processor got hotter and had no way of actively cooling itself. Again, I don't think many people will be using this as a workstation type machine and doing many renders constantly, but if you do find yourself editing day in and day out, the MacBook Pro could have a slight advantage. It's got a larger battery and a fan for active cooling when required, and actually has no substantial weight or physical difference to the MacBook Air. It's a little more expensive, and given the M1X might be right around the corner, maybe I'd say wait out just to see at least, but otherwise, this would be the smarter choice for video editors on the go. Finally, is something both M1 portables suffer with at the moment, and that's limited ports. Both computers have two Thunderbolt 3 ports, which have a lot of potential bandwidth, and they're great for using with a hub, but hubs can be expensive, and they're not always portable. If you're out in the field and needing to plug in your SD card, SSD, and potentially another hard drive at the same time, you either have the right combination of adapters, or sadly, you're straight out of luck. I used to own the Intel MacBook Pro up until last year, and with four Thunderbolt ports, I very rarely had to worry about not being able to plug in devices because I didn't have a hub nearby. If you find that you plug in a lot of physical devices, the rumored M1X MacBook Pro is likely to be bringing back a HDMI port and an SD card slot. But even then, if it only had four Thunderbolt ports, I still think this would be better than just having two, especially if this is your main machine for video work. And then there's software. Native support was a big deal when this computer was first released. You see, Apple's move to its own silicon means that programs need to be updated to work natively with the new processor. Apple has done a great job with Rosetta 2, which converts applications designed to run on Intel Macs to the M1 chip on the fly. Kind of like translating a conversation in a different language in real time, which makes it even more impressive that a few Intel apps actually gain speed running on the M1 under Rosetta. 
However, the great news is, as I'm recording this video, the three big professional editing applications, Final Cut Pro, Premiere Pro, and DaVinci Resolve are all now running natively on Apple Silicon. This means you should be getting the best performance on each of them, no matter the platform you edit on. Resolve 17.3 has just been released and it's claiming up to three times speed improvements, stating you can now edit 8K video on the M1 chip. I can't say I've tried editing 8K, but so far Resolve has been able to take anything I could throw at it in terms of media. I've tried up to 4K 100fps footage from my Sony a7S, and it's playing back in real time with very few hiccups, which is highly impressive. Final Cut Pro has been native from the start, and honestly, given it's an Apple app, speeds have been really impressive from launch. If you're a Final Cut user, it's definitely no worries here. And finally, Premiere Pro is the latest to become native. However, from watching Max Tech's video and testing it out myself, Adobe is really falling behind the pack here in terms of speed. It's definitely the slowest when it comes to playback, and rendering also wasn't great, with a minute sequence taking 62 seconds to render, which doesn't sound bad until you realize Resolve did it in 58 seconds with color grading and transitions applied, whereas Premiere was just the raw footage. Sadly, it still feels like Premiere isn't taking full advantage of the system, and for those still editing in it, I would say a computer with a more powerful processor might make more sense. What I've found is that the M1 MacBook Air works really well for basic editing tasks. This includes construction and playback of timelines, adding basic titles, speed ramping, even for high frame rate footage, adding transitions, and basic color grading. But once you start to push it, you can definitely hit the ceiling. I see this especially with noise reduction in DaVinci Resolve, which is my main editing application. Honestly, it can be such an intensive effect that even my Mac Pro can start dropping frames depending on how much of it I apply. As I stated before, a one minute sequence that took 58 seconds to render on the M1 took nearly 10 minutes once I applied temporal noise reduction to each clip. And I tested this across multiple codecs on both the Sony A7S III and FX6 and got the same result. Again, if you're not applying a lot of intensive effects, this MacBook Air has been really great for everyday editing tasks. As I spoke about at the start, your main considerations will really come down to the practicality aspects and whether or not video editing is your primary purpose for this computer. If you're editing videos shot on your phone with iMovie, it's a no-brainer, it'll work. But once you start working with professional cameras, applying processor-intensive effects, and trying to make it your primary machine, you're likely to start to notice some of the drawbacks beyond the smaller screen, the limited ports, and no active cooling. To wrap this up, I really believe the M1 MacBook Air can be used as a professional video editing tool when we're talking more about YouTube, corporate, and maybe real estate videos. Music videos, maybe not so much, given they tend to rely more on intensive filters and effects. And for feature length films, I would say it may also be a stretch too, given you'd want to have more than 16 gigabytes of RAM for those hour plus timelines. Definitely don't try it in Premiere. However, if you're editing a lot on these computers, be aware that pushing this device to the max day in and day out is kind of like flooring a car consistently. Yes, it may work in the short term, but having a processor constantly being hot and the hard drive being used excessively for caching will mean a shorter lifespan in the long run for these components. The M1 Mac Mini is a better solution if you don't need the portability, given its better cooling ability and more ports. Honestly, it's a real steal for its price. But if you do end up going for a MacBook Air or Pro, my recommendation is to bump up the RAM. I've been using an eight gigabyte machine, which has done pretty well, but going to 16 gigabytes would be even better, especially if you do a lot of editing. And lastly, I always tell people, if you're using a machine to make videos, don't chase the storage space. Make sure you have enough for all your apps and all the other files you need to keep with you, but otherwise keep your raw files on separate drives. If you do a lot of video work, you know there's no single drive big enough to store all your raw footage from multiple projects. And while editing, it makes sense to invest in an external SSD drive to edit your videos from. It will not only be cheaper than upgrading a Mac's internal storage, but also it'll help take the pressure off your internal drive as well. I also wanna say thank you for all of your support so far. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, like the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more content around video production. And I'll see you all in the next video.